welcome, welcome, and welcome to the Gym Master Show Live Entertainment Lifestyle Celebrity Talk Show Series. Hope you guys are doing well today, and I hope you're in the mood for a great conversation and lots more of surprises as we welcome a very special guest coming to us, our neighbors to the north. Now, we're here in the United States in the New York area. For those of you watching for the first time, beautiful sunny day here, 34 degrees. You know, it is still winter at the time of the show today. But our guest is coming to us, our neighbors to the north in Canada from Ontario. She is a celebrated, revered, and renowned singer and songwriter. She's also an author. She's a coach, music coach as well. And she's penned a fabulous book, which helps folks in the music industry, breaking into the music industry, already immersed in the industry, to sort of survive the industry, which has changed so much over the years, just in how music is made and how it's displayed and presented with all the things like Spotify and iTunes and Apple and just everything has changed. The game has changed. And sometimes it's very hard for an independent artist to realize different steps you need to take and different ways to just not lose, you know, that vibe, that passion you have for wanting to be in the industry and uh, survive it and also let your music be heard by the world. And she, since she's been a singer songwriter and immersed in the music industry for over 30 years, has written a fabulous new book that specializes in just that. It's going to be a great conversation, of course, about her incredible music career and things she's working on as well, but also celebrating the really cool book that she's got. There it is, You and the Music Business. Really, it's designed to empower independent artists. And it's a self-care book, really, uh, which I think is absolutely fantastic. It's a self-care book and guide really designed to finding balance and joy in today's music industry. And as I mentioned, our guest is Tara Shannon coming to us from Ontario, Canada. She's been making music. She loves music. And now she's written this book as an expert in the music industry about how to really survive it and take the self-care. You know, in all these industries, even like what I do in television, radio, stage, and film, there's a lot of demands. Today, Crazy Day, I've been on the radio hosting five radio shows, working on television scripts, answering all kinds of phone calls and texts and emails. I literally just got off the air from the radio show in New York about 10 minutes ago and then jumped into this chair to present the Gym Master Show. It gets crazy sometimes with the amount of things that are going on, but we love it. It juices us up and we do what we do and we share it with all of you. Tara has been doing that as well, and I'm so excited to welcome her to the show. If you'd like to interact with our show, it is live right now. Yeah, the show is live. We archive it too, so you can watch it again later on our YouTube channel, Gym Masters TV. We archive all the episodes. There's almost 2,000 of them on our YouTube channel, Gym Masters TV. However, if you want to interact while the show is live and say hi to me and to Tara and to one another, you can in our lovely whole chat room. And uh, if you get a chance, give the episode a thumbs up, like, subscribe to our YouTube channel. I'll say that right out of the gate because it really, really helps our series grow. And when, we, when you do leave a comment on the uh, channel as well, gang, it helps us grow as well. More people get a chance to see the episodes and these amazing conversations here in Lovety Hall and uh, and so much more. We're going to welcome Tara to our show. As I mentioned, renowned singer-songwriter Tara is a luminary in the music industry for over three decades, and she's taken a bold leap into the literary world with the launch of her groundbreaking book, You and the Music Business, a self-care guide to finding balance and joy in today's music industry under Lucky Book Publishing. In this trailblazing work, Shannon shares a treasure trove of insights, practical advice, empowering strategies tailored for independent artists navigating the ever-evolving landscape of the music industry, drawing upon her extensive 30-year journey as a music professional, entrepreneur, mentor to countless artists. Tara doesn't just offer a roadmap through the intricacies of the industry. She invites artists to embark on a journey of self-discovery and reclaim power over their art and careers. It's been described as a must-have guide, which is really something quite special. Something, there it is again, it truly has been described as a must-have guide for all in the industry, independent artists and industry pros alike. You and the music business has garnered enthusiastic praise as well. And we're going to talk about that and so much more as we get ready to welcome her to the show. Yes, it's really exciting. Coming to us live from Ontario, Canada, Tara Shannon is in the house. Welcome, Tara. 
Good to have you with us. Hi, thank you so much. I'm very excited to be here. Well, I'm excited too. And it's been really cool putting this all together and celebrating, you know, your artistry and everything that you're doing. And what, you know, inspired you initially to even go into the music industry? Were you somebody always singing around the house? Were you in school plays? Did the, is there an entertainment value in your family? Were there other people that were entertainers? How did it all spark early for you, Shannon? Yeah, I fell, I fell in love with music when I was little. Like at seven, my mom put me in piano lessons and I'm the eldest of six kids. And so, yes. and I just like from the start, just fell in love with music and the piano and playing. And so I studied the Royal Conservatory of Music through uh, with the piano. And then um, later in high school, luckily I went to a high school where being in the band was like super cool. Everybody wanted to be in the band. Right. <laughs> so I, I picked up um, the saxophone and learned uh, the saxophone, which led me to McGill, which is a university in Montreal. And um, I got um, early acceptance and a scholarship to study music performance as a jazz saxophone player. So my path was kind of like, I knew music was gonna be my life. I just wasn't sure which path. So performance, and I really loved the idea of music therapy. So this was 30 years ago, now more than 30 years ago. So music therapy was just starting um, to be a, an accredited thing you could do. And I really loved that. But then I wrote my first song and it was all downhill from there. <laughs> was it really? <laughs> <laughs> well, I fell in love with a whole new aspect of music that I wasn't you know, even aware of. And my cousin was getting married and I was like, what do I, she'd asked me to sing at her wedding. And so we were working up the songs that she wanted to do. And I was like, oh, wouldn't it be nice to like write a song for her? And now I joke about that in my coaching. I'm like, if you're going to write your first song, somebody's wedding day is not necessarily the place to be sharing that very first song. No, work it out first before they hear it, <laughs> yeah, right? Because they will never forget it. I know. So luckily mine was not a disaster situation, but um, the process of songwriting uh, for me was just another level. And I, I, that's when I just like fell in love with this whole idea of performing and singing and writing my own songs. And so that led me down the recording artist path. Um, wow. Yeah. <laughs> now, do you, what got you to really want to coach people? I think that's the fascinating part and help them and guide them because it does get a little dicey. The music industry has changed greatly, as I said, you know, in the introduction so much. When did you decide to, you know, add in to being the performer, the coaching side of what you're doing? I th think, um, I mean, I've always run businesses since my first com little business I started at 16. I think, you know, my entrepreneurial mind helped me figure out the music business. And when I would cross paths with artists who were having trouble understanding the mechanics of the business structure of it, I would, you know, it just started as casual kind of conversations about how to, how to understand the way that it works. And then it grew into something more formal because, you know, it's, it's, it's very challenging. Well, like you said already, Jim, like the industry now is completely different to the model, you know, 30 years ago and plus. So what so many artists were feeling was just incredible frustration and feeling sort of lost and not really understanding how to maneuver it because the messaging we get overwhelmingly is you need to like, you need to suck it up. You need to like, you know, you know, dig deep and just like earn your dues and stuff until somebody with power discovers you, determines you more special than everybody else and plucks you from the masses and elevates you to stardom. And then your, you know, your, your music life is made. And so you're, it's a very kind of um, disempowering situation you're in all the time or the messaging is that way. So my messaging was that is one way, like that's one business path. But you don't have to wait, especially now these days. We, uh, independent music creators have all the tools they need to build their own, to build a business around their music. So we have the internet, so we can build our own audience. We have technology, which is affordable now, so everybody and their dog can afford to make a record in their basement, you know, and it sounds good and can compete if you're talented. And so we have all the tools, but what's missing most of the time is the understanding of marketing, the understanding of brand identity how to communicate yourself as a product because we are essentially a product. Um, and so the business conversations, you know, how to access money, how to manage money, how to run your cash flow, you know, 
and and so those elements are really what I focused on is just trying to give people the building blocks to understand how to how to build a business around their music and then create you know build a sustainable living. Now, are you still doing your thing in the studio, recording and doing everything that you can to get that voice out there and sing for all of us? I I am. I'm working on a really exciting project right now. This will be my eighth studio project. Wow. And uh, so I'm recording down in Nashville. And uh, it's a it's a really this is the first time I've actually talked about it publicly. So you'll get the scoop. Um, um, so it's a it's a celebration of the Canadian female artists who inspired me. So it's a very full circle record. So the producer on the project uh, made a lot of the music I grew up listening to. His name is Jim Ed Norman. He's a legendary visionary in in oh, Nashville yeah. and beyond. And um, so he made a lot of the music that I grew up on. You know, so the Eagles and Kenny Rogers and Anne Murray mm. and stuff. And so the whole story of this record is very full circle. So it's it's music that influenced me. It's me honoring and celebrating the female Canadian artists that influenced me. And then we're featuring three young female artists on the record as well that I've coached or mentored that are coming up. So it, the whole story is this, you know, pay it forward. It's the, the, the circular nature of artist development and coming into who we are as an artist. So yeah, so we're just doing the finishing touches on that record um, and it's been so fun. I've got, have had the chance to work with incredible musicians and uh, we're all very excited about the final, the final product. Nashville is the place right now, right? Nashville and Vegas. I mean, these places are just really, it's extraordinary. And um, you've gotten a chance to work with a lot of incredible people in Nashville, huh? Yeah, I spent. I started going there about ten years ago, and um, I had I had taken a break from music for. I have seven children, and they all play. Yes, music. you do. I I didn't. I was going to lead up to that. I was going <laughs> to yeah. build up to that. You know, yeah. we don't uh, shock people right off the bat. We kind of ease into that. But yeah, seven seven children, yeah. right? Yes. What are, What are the ages? Uh, my eldest will be thirty one next week. <sighs> that went fine in New York minute, huh? I, I can't, when I say that out loud, I'm like, oh my God. So yeah, 31, 29, 27, 25, 23, 21, and soon to be 18. Wow. Yeah. That's amazing. Are they, any of them in the music environment as well? Yeah. I mean, they're all musical. They all, um, they love to jam together and, and play guitar and sing more now than ever. Um, but one of my kids, my third oldest, um, actually just graduated from sound engineering school from the same school I went to later in life to get my diploma in sound engineering. And so he's really dedicated to a life in, in music. And he was a, he was an NCAA hockey player. Was he really? He was. And so I had two on NCAA scholarships and I, you know, he, we were having this conversation because the pandemic and stopped the league and they're playing and everything, you know? And so, you know, he's like, he fell in love with music, wanted to do music. And I was like, wait, wait, this means you're going to live with me forever. But if you play professional hockey, I could live with you. So we really need to talk about this. Exactly. <laughs> but he, loved it. he loves it so much. And so he's, uh, yeah, he's pursuing it. That is really, really cool. So how do you, I know a lot of people are asking right now, I'm sure, how the heck does she balance being in the public eye, being in a recording studio, singing, songwriting, now in the literary world, doing, going to Nashville, doing what you got to do? How are you balancing it all? It's such a great question. And also, I learned things the hard way, which is why I really wanted to write this book to help people not have to learn the hard way. Because balance is, you know, it's it's really important, you know, to, for health, for mental health and physical health. And I, I wasn't doing it well. And I ran into physical health issues. I had a physical health crisis. And so I really had to learn the tools to do it well. And um, there was a professor, a story this professor was telling, and I was on socials or something like that. And it was like about golf balls. So imagine like a, a jar, a clear jar and the professor had, and I may not have all these details right, but the, the core of it is, is, is what's moving. So he had a clear jar and he had golf balls and he had rocks and then he had sand and then he had water. And he put the water in the jar first and said, can I fit anything else in? Class says, no. He puts the sand in, fills the jar up with sand. Can I fit anything else in? He said, no. So he did it the opposite way. He started with the golf balls and then he put the smaller rocks in, which filled in the holes. And then the sand, which filled in the crevices even more. And then the water, which filled in everything else. 
So the point being that if you know what your golf balls are, you know what your priorities are and what your value system is, and you focus on those first, it leaves a lot of room for all the other stuff. And so that's how I had to learn, you know, balance is to be really um, connected with what, what's my why. And I talk about that in the book, like what are the things that truly matter to me and I have to have in a day for me to feel grounded and connected. Um, and then from there, I can add the other stuff in. That's so very, very true. How long did it take you to write the book and put it all, you know, it, it's a book, but it's a self-help guide. It's rich with information that can really be helpful to those who are starting out or pros who have been in it for a long time that may need some, you know, tips to stay in it. Yeah, I think it took probably, I mean, from beginning to end, like holding a copy, probably a year maybe a little over a year because I was, you know, I would sketch things from my coaching sessions and, and I had a, an idea of the book, but, it, when it, you know, lots of people talk about writing a book, you know, but when you get down to it and you actually have to like execute it, it's, it is very time consuming. Um, so yeah, probably about a year. And what's interesting is because the focus of this book is very much self care. It's not, this is how you make it in the music business because there's, there's lots of great books about that. This is why do you want to be in the music business? And if you're in the music business, how, what do you need to do to navigate it and stay like, not go crazy, like stay grounded and feel joy along the way. Um, so yeah, so um, yeah, it took about a year and then I found a publisher and um, we partnered to put it out there and the feedback has been incredible and not just people in the music business. Like I've had people share it that are just like authors or in other creative industries that are finding really valuable information in it because it's it's really how do you live as a creative because we and you i mean you know this part of your job is creative you're in this space too and and so we live in a culture that values things based on how much it earns money mm -hmm. right? so when you're a creative person and what you create doesn't earn money yet it's a it's a tricky place to be as far as your self-worth and your self-identity and your and your reason for being and your sense of purpose because for music creators particularly you know like it's just part of who you are you can try wow. to put it to bed but it it's it always creeps back in so you're in this constant state of like tug and war about how much time and money to spend on it because is it going to make your money back you know you're taking time away from your family What's the value in that? So that's what the converse, the book encourages conversation around those very real issues about what it is to be a creative. What are some of the things you've been dealing with in addition to that to be able to keep you going? How have you found, you know, that spark within to be able to keep forging forward in this difficult industry? I think... You know, when I, I took us a, a little break from music because I had so many kids and I was I was running um, their dad and I had started a, a company that ended up growing into this monstrous company that really took all of our time. So in that break um, and I took a, a short break and then got very sick and then I was reevaluating my life. And what changed for me in that moment, my relationship with music was it was my why that changed because before I was, you know, motivated by people saying you need a record deal this is what you need to do you need a publishing deal you need to you know you need to get sync or whatever so you're chasing 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 and you're you're you know you're trying to build this thing so on after my break when i came back to it i realized that it was no longer about the tour bus and you know selling out a big show or having a number one hit song on radio it was just that I needed to express and create music in my everyday life to feel whole and to feel grounded. And so my reasons shifted. It became about um, having joy in my life and feeling purposeful as a human being, not productive as a music creator who's then going to earn her entire living through just creating music. So when my why shifted, it, it made things a lot, a lot easier. To, to balance and to manage it. Why is an important thing? It's usually the question I always ask in life, whether it's myself I'm asking or just people in general, because I think when you, when you get the why, then you feel it. The why is very attached to feeling and depth and the soul. And then once you feel the why, wh why are we doing this? Why is this happening? Why? Then you can work on the nuts and bolts of it. The what, when, who, where, how, 
But if you feel the why, it really enriches the experience of trying to do all the other stuff to make the why happen, right? Uh, absolutely. I mean, what's your why is an entire chapter in the book or section of the chapter of, of, a, um, of a section because, and also when you ask yourself the why, it's very revealing because sometimes we feel really motivated to do something, but when we sit with it and go, why, why are we doing, why do I want to do this? What's my why? And you break it down. You realize that it's rooted in anxiety or a fear. Like I'll have this conversation with my artists on my label, Willow Sound, and there's this, and this actually is across the board for most artists that I coach. There's this, this feeling that builds up, like I have to get something out. I have to get something out. I have to release something. I'll be like, okay, why? Well, I because understand. like I have to get something out. I'm like, okay, why? So your answer is to manage your emotional state because there's a feeling that if I'm not putting music out, then I'm not truly an artist, right? Like, so once you, once you break those things apart and say, you are an artist. It doesn't matter what you do. You could never put out another song for the rest of your life. It doesn't change a thing. You are an, a music creator. You are an artist. So now let's make a decision about resources, how much money you have, and what a release plan would look like based on not emotionally charged information. So we're not using to, it to manage your state, but we're seeing more clearly because your feet are on the ground again. So the why question is important for not only clarity of vision and what to do next, but also like really to sort through being out of alignment sometimes, you know, with, with yourself. Which happens, right? Sometimes things get a little, like you mentioned, you know, being in the industry and then having to take some time because you fell ill. Do you think all the running and just being so immersed in the industry and everything that it takes and the stress and all of it, can contribute to not feeling well and having times when you're off balance or an illness can come along. If you don't practice the self-care, the self-help to not only navigate the industries that we're in, but also take time for you so you can breathe and nourish your mind, body, and spirit. Like absolutely. And the, the biggest tipping point that I see in my coaching is the effect of social media on artists. So Good and bad, right? Yeah. Right. Like the single best tool we have on life in general, not just right? the music industry. Yeah. yeah. And like it's a health risk in, in general, but for, and for artists, um, they're kind of in this weird in between place of like regular people who use social media to stay connected to friends and family and then content creators, which are focused on earning a living on those platforms. So music creators fall in this weird middle place where you have to create enough content for the algorithms to recognize you and reward you and, and, and go out there and get the potential new audience. Um, but it's so time consuming and draining to keep up that pace that it, it, it stops you from being able to do the things that are truly you, creating music, doing shows, all those things. So right. <clears throat> I would say probably like 70% of my coaching conversations are about managing emotional mental health around the demands of social media. And two, the instant gratification thing, you know, you used to be able to have things that were extended, whether it's a conversation, whether it's music, appreciating certain things in life where it was okay if you reserved some time, took some time to really go deep and experience it and feel it, and then take elements of that with you throughout the rest of your day, throughout your week, your month, your year, your life. Now everything is so compressed. Everything is so rushed. Everything is so next that you don't have time or the world seems to not want you to take the time to appreciate what was just tasted, heard, experienced, um, created, and not so good. I mean, you need, we all need as human beings, we need collaboration. We need together time. We need face to face, but we also need touch is another thing. We, some of these things just going away, but we also need to have a space where if you walk through a botanical garden, don't run through it, walk through it. Look, if you're going to take the pictures, if you're going to, you know, post them live, whatever you do, but don't miss what you're seeing in the botanical garden. For me, the ocean is my go-to. We were within blocks. I always grew up here on the East coast of the United States in the Northeast. We are, the ocean is here 
when we go to family in Florida, the ocean, I'm in it, surfing, boogie boarding, sailing it. The ocean for me, the, the tide, the sun rising, the sun setting, walking barefoot, you know, surfing, boogie boarding, swimming it. I get very grounded, re-energized because of the rhythm, the tide, the warmth, the power that it has. It's greater than me. So there's some things that are greater than me that I give the power over to. And if I respect it, it'll provide great pleasure, but it's really in charge. It runs the show. I'm now in its domain. To me, that's incredible stuff. When you go into a botanical garden, don't rush through it. You know, when you're watching a movie, don't talk through it <laughs> and don't, you know, so I think that that's a problem in a way because you, as we see, no matter how many times people will say, oh, well, that's just the way things are. And it's cooler and hipper if everything is just a six second video and whatever. I think there are some psychological things that are happening, the way society is reacting towards one another. I think there's a lot of negativity, divisiveness, yelling, screaming, but nobody listening. And you can see it, how people are acting out on the highways, in the stores, in, you know, schools, wherever it is around the world, um, people are uptake and frustrated and they, they can't answer the emails quick enough and the texts. And, you know, the phone is now 24 seven, somebody texts you and they want an answer at two o'clock in the morning when you're sleeping and maybe you have the flu and they they still want that answer. Uh, that over time maybe seems exciting and everything. And you can have that. You can, we all we're in, we're immersed in that world. We have our social media, we have all our stuff, but I think, over time, if you're only focused just on that and you don't allow for the other part to savor your accomplishments, savor time with people you care about, listen to the music more than once. Every time you hear a song, you hear something different. Wow, I didn't know there was a triangle in the middle of that song. Wow, that gives it a different perspective. Go through the botanical garden and stop and look and, and appreciate the beauty of nature. All of these things, I think, are having an effect on us. You know, people are constantly checking Facebook. They're constantly competing with one another and trying to top one another. And they're constantly feeling, it's the first thing they do in the morning. It's not even, good morning, honey, I love you. It's, ooh, did somebody, you know, comment on my thing? It's, it's cool and it's fun and we were all in on it, however, you know, I've always said if it went away for one full year as an experiment, I'm good because life existed prior and it was a little more, it was calmer. We took the time to walk through the botanical garden and experience it. We took the time to say hello and check in on each other. We took the time to go to the store and spend some time perusing, you know, the, the records and listening and sampling or trying on the sweater or whatever. And a lot of these experiences are fading away and it's becoming so technological now. Uh, you don't even know what's real and what's not real and who really cares and who doesn't. It's a conversation we've had with several guests over the years anyway, sort of weave that in. But, you know, it's all great to have all the technology and the social media and the contact and everything else, but you have to manage it. It shouldn't be ruling or running or the basis of your life. Uh, I will never allow it to be mine uh, because my favorite experiences are when I'm not on it, <laughs> when I'm with people, when I'm in a studio or we're on a location shoot or it's Christmas day with my family or we're at the park or the ocean. Those are the times we're having birthday cake, whatever. We're, we're playing guitar with friends. Those are the times that really, really matter most. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's it's so ironic that these devices that are sold to us. I digress. <laughs> yeah, but I was just going to say it's so ironic that these devices sold to us for connection actually encourage disconnection, disconnection from each other, disconnection from our own heart and mind space, disconnection from nature, like you're saying, the powerful place that is nature, you know, to, to reconnect, um, you know, to yourself so that you can connect to others. And the way we consume music, you know, I mean, the whole landscape of the music business has changed greatly because of how we consume. Like when we came up listening to music, you had to wait. You had to wait for the record store to get the album. 
You had to wait outside the record store if it was a very popular record in line to get in. Then you had to go home with your vinyl and it was this whole experience you'd have where you'd pull it out of the vinyl, you would read all of the credits, you put the vinyl on and you would, it was an experience like a five course meal. Now the way we consume music is like drive through fast food, like McDonald's. <laughs> and even now, like I watch my kids, how they consume music and they will listen to the beginning of the song and then the drop in the chorus, get the dopamine hit and move to the next track. Like even the length of a song, like we're talking about lengths of song shortening and shortening. And, you know, so, so we, I mean, to summarize what you're saying, I think we are just, we are largely disconnected, you know, as, as a, as a, as a people. And I think those spurts you were talking about, about seeing sort of crazy land, crazy here and there that we wouldn't see before this sort of microaggressions. I wonder, and I've read some studies on this because we don't daydream anymore like remember when you used to sit in the in the doctor's office you didn't have Best. to would daydream. It. daydream it yeah right and places right. where we had to wait the kids if they weren't stimulated with some kind of screen or something they would daydream they would yeah. be creative and there is like actual functionality of the brain that that affects and it's kind of like being sleep deprived but in micro doses and i think you know we're seeing these sort of bursts of of behavior partly because of the effect of that Right. The removal of it, the lack of the daydreaming, yeah. brainstorming in that way, going outside yourself. Um, and, and I mean, look what happened with the pandemic where people, you know, baked bread and they watched nostalgic TV shows and movies and they pulled out their music collection and were listening to it and they were reading books and they were talking to one another. They couldn't necessarily be together. But the ones that were in the house were together communicating and then people checking in on each other and sort of this, you know, feeling like, OK, we're all in it together. And then as soon as things started getting better, everybody's like out for themselves. The, the Everybody's rushing in the road rage and all the craziness. And, and and now it's like the opposite. And you would figure things like that would bring us all together because we are surviving hopefully this situation collectively as a planet and you know it's uh, it's really fascinating to me like you say yeah i showed a friend uh the movie with spencer tracy and katherine hepburn guess who's coming to dinner sydney mm -hmm. portier mm -hmm. and now that's a movie that has incredible music in it incredible production value, a spectacular script, humor, warmth, depth, social message of the time. And yet, and, and one of the movies where it's not all flash and dash and cars blowing up and action and boom, bam, not loud in all the rest. There's a place for that too. But this particular movie was not filmed, edited, written, produced, that way it's to draw you in and to just have you sort of wash away the craziness of the day and follow the characters and listen to their uh, voices and what they're saying and look at the facial expressions and the way the camera swoops in and that music that comes in the, the underscoring all of these things that give you time to emote and feel connected to the characters and this friend said about a quarter into that movie it's too slow. I said, there's I'm not, there's yeah. no speed with this movie. This movie yeah. isn't a speed movie. This movie is one that when you watch it in its entirety, uninterrupted, you're going to be left with something pretty cool that you're going to feel. Yeah. You know, I, 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 another one we showed was on Golden Pond with Henry Fonda and Jane Fonda and Catherine Hepburn, another moving deep, you know, an older couple and he's ill and just rekindling things and just the relationship with the daughter and too slow. I'm like, are you not even listening to that incredible music score and yeah. just, you're not feeling it and what you're not getting with the cinematographer and the writers are trying to deliver no, it's too, it's too, it's too slow. I'm like, too slow. I have to, I have to be able to sit with myself and be comfortable with myself long enough to enjoy this movie. 
you know, but we're like you know, the speed thing, you know, we talk about like in the workshops I do and stuff, we talk about that we're in an attention economy. So what we're buying and selling are eyeballs on screens and minutes, people's like life minutes. And so by virtue of that, everything is just about grabbing somebody's attention. So you're constantly feeling pulled at. So we're in this sort of this different speed of things. And that's with or without credibility or yeah. quality yeah. or care or empathy. It's just no matter how you get it, just get it. And if you are somebody who was either raised or trained or educated or just is of the belief that credibility and quality and time and care and attention are still virtues. They're still important. They're, they still, when you get the prize as a result of that, the riches of putting the time in, it's deeper. It's more important. You've earned it. That, that sort of sensation is also being erased. And <sighs> I've struggled with that too, even myself, because I've always been in this industry and everything I've done in life. I wanted to make a difference and I wanted to people to feel it and hopefully enjoy it, whatever it is, and experience it along, you know, taking you on a journey. Let's go on this journey together. And I wanted to have some quality attached to it. You know what I mean? I don't want it to be stiff and rigid, uh, but I want it to be something where it isn't just schlock just thrown together selling your soul out to just get the quick hit because you know we can try that but i would look in the mirror and say the hell are you doing that's that's not you knock it off no, get back get really back not. in there and go yeah. and do it create quality get in there and make magic well it comes back down to your why because i can tell just briefly looking at your community here that you know, you're in it for connection. And human connection takes time. It takes time to build a connection with an audience. It takes time to build trust. It takes time for people to get to know us and our personality and all the flavors of our personality. If you're in it for the views, the streams, the clicks and stuff like that, then you don't take the time to open the space up, have two-way conversation. You've invited your audience to connect with the guests and ask questions, you know, and all of that takes time. And we need that emotional connection in order to invest the time, you know, to, to stay present with it. And unfortunately, the, this, the systems in the digital space are, aren't really designed for that, you know. So in comparative to other things that are, you know, just fast moving and surface and clickbaity, you know, it seems uh, slower. And I always joke with my artists, you know, like, you know, we, we painstakingly, you know, take a song and we, you know, we think of a music video and a storyboard and the characters and we find ways to finance it and to fund it. And we, there's so much heart and care put into the storytelling of it. And then we put it out into the world and it gets some traction, but a cat video will get 5 million views in 10 minutes. <laughs> You know, so it's it's like it can be it's so discouraging if you're comparing those metrics. But you have to keep coming back to your why. Why are we doing it? Because we're artists and we want to put something out into the world that's beautiful or that causes people to think or feel something. And so that all moves so much slower than you know clickbaity type stuff. <laughs> but I think there's also if if you're lucky and you do it right, there's longevity. Uh, because you've built, you know, when some of those things come and go, the, the, the flavor of the month, the, the quick little hit, um, maybe there's that quick, psh, but then you have to, then, then you have to top that. You, you have to sustain that. Then you have to top that. And now you're in the business of just topping yourself as opposed to doing something that, you know, of course you want all those things to happen, the, the the viewing and the response and the interaction and the growth, or if you just keep doing that and, and none of that happens, then maybe it's time to move on and try other things or, or spend all the energy on the other thing you were going to do anyway. But so if there is growth and there is energy and people are coming along for the journey or the ride, it's a beautiful thing. But if you're doing it so you can go from here to just like this now you have to maintain and top that. And that's when sometimes the quality and the time and attention that you talk about and the credibility and all the rest start to suffer because it's hard to maintain that constantly when you have other things in your life going on. 
And so I think um, it's better to, and I've talked to a lot of people and I'm sure a lot of the people that you work with, the artists, they're sometimes they struggle with all of that because they're like, wait a minute, I understand that I got to put this out quickly and then I got to put more out and then I got to interact and then I got to do this and do this. I just want to make music. I love what I do. This is who I am. This is what I'm about. And if people like what I'm doing and there are some things that result from it, you know, you can pay your bills and then you grow, maybe you get a little nicer car, whatever goes on as a result of it, it, you don't lose the sense of the why that you're taking all these hours, all these days, all this energy and stress and investment to do it. Uh, and I think that's so important to remember. So you probably have a lot of artists who are very good at what they do and things have flipped upside down in their world on how it's done and what people are wanting quickly and demanding quickly and have had to sort of work through their stress and anxiety about that because they don't want it to affect the music they're creating, the art they're creating. They don't want it diminished, devalued. They don't want to compete against the cat video or the person that jumps and does tumble salts backwards with no clothes on in their swimming pool. And then they post that video and they get a million views and likes and all this other, they don't want to compete with that though. They feel that in order to be even visible, not just relevant, but even visible, they have to somehow get in that lane and compete against that kind of a thing. Or, you know, it's a, you deal with that with your clients, I'm sure. Huh? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. We, we deal with, you know, not, you know, not giving into the chase where you're trying to chase something, but to just have confidence that slow and steady wins the race, slow and steady and consistent creativity wins the race. It's, it's, it's sometimes not helpful because right now the trend is that um, bigger labels, major labels, right? They're looking at TikTok, for example, and looking at things that go viral on TikTok and then, and then artists are getting a deal or getting signed when they've done this, this thing. So artists, not not signed artists will be looking in on that and saying, okay, well, if I could just go viral, you know, I just need one thing to go viral and then it will open opportunity for you. And, you know, it's not that, that is true because there is examples of that, of that happening, obviously. But if that is your only motivation and that's what you're chasing, that is a really awful, empty, not soul sucking kind of road that you could be setting yourself up for with a, with a maybe, a maybe something happens, which you can't control. Like you can't control what goes viral. You can't control whether any uh, other company would be interested in you if it does. So it, it, to be balanced and to stay grounded and to be happy, you really, um, a plan that involves things that you can control, you know, really, really helps and goes a long way. And and we had an artist go viral on something and, and I, I promise it is not what it's all, what it's all cracked up to be. You know, it was it was a really awful situation to to navigate because they went viral in a negative way where they were cyber bullied. But in like it made it all the way to the Tonight Show, uh, the, the sorry, the Daily Show in the States, like it hit American media at the top. So it was it was a big situation. And, it you know, it's it's you're plugging into a machine, essentially the machine that is just churning out content that's going to create the highest ad dollar. Right. Like it's not about people. It's not about the effect on people or anything like that. So the frustration in the digital space with with artists is very real and all the time. And it's become sort of a, your numbers like there's vanity metrics and conversion metrics. So we focus on conversion metrics only. So a conversion metric is very small and, and kind of boring in the sense that if your if your video gets a thousand views and you get 10 new subscribers, you are winning the day all day, like a 10% turnaround is amazing. Vanity metrics is like, I got a million views. And I'm like, that's great. How many subscribers? Well, none. Okay. So what did that actually do for you? If it's on a paying platform, sure, you'll get some residuals and some back end money a little bit, but certainly not enough to retire on. And, and you know, as, as you know, but it didn't do anything to build actual community around you and your music. And that is the only thing that matters. The, your, all of your power as a, as a music creator is in the fans. It's in the fan base and the relationship. Exactly. And for you, it's your, your, relation, your relationship, right? Yeah. And nurturing that and growing it yes. and respecting it and valuing it. Uh, yes. All the things that we were, that I, 
actually, I was going to say that we were trained to do in co college and we were told by people that were uh, at levels higher than us, this is how you do it, this, be professional, do the things you do. But I would say even within my family, that's how we were raised to have value and respect one another and care for one another and take care of one another and lighten the load. And then they'll lighten the load for you and reciprocal and, and that we're all on this journey. It's a team. It's, it's a family. It's a community. It's whatever it is. And I think that's probably one of the things that has always drawn me to this industry is that team, that community. So the community that's in the studio, the television studio, the radio stu studio, or on location when we're filming, that crew, everybody has a, there's all these puzzle pieces that all need to plug in and fit. And, and I appreciate what the grip does and what the jib operator does, you know, the camera for those watching the big, you know, when you see a camera angle that sort of swoops down, that's like a big arm, you know, it's a jib camera and somebody operating it. And just what everybody is involved in. And we're, we're all, I'm very communal anyway. So those mm -hmm. kinds of things are really, really cool. And I appreciate all of that. And I think then there is the listeners on radio and the viewers on television or film and stage that you then plug into and hopefully create that relationship with. Whether you ever hear from them, whether they ever comment or they just enjoy it, knowing that they're there. And if they do bump into you in the supermarket, which I've had many times, or they, I, I've had, you know, through my professional work, people that are like shut ins who write lengthy, warm, outpouring of love letters. And I keep all that stuff. I have a whole career scrapbook and it's in a climate control storage <laughs> unit with all the tape, with all the tapes and the, the videos of the career and all that stuff um, and photo albums and all the things. And I'll pull a letter like that out every once in a while and be like, that's why I do what I do. That's why I'm in the public eye. That's why I go with all the things that that entails, which includes craziness. And, uh, <laughs> is that letter that that woman wrote in an apartment somewhere saying that she lost her husband years ago, she's alone, but she tunes into whatever that I'm doing and it comforts her. It brings her joy, it brings her humor. Um, it, it makes her feel good about life and continues. She looks forward to it. And I think that kind of thing, like if you have an artist that is beloved, and they're putting out new content and music, albums, whatever, streams, downloads, a tour. They're going to be on stage. And there's this fanfare of people looking forward to it. That's the icing on the cake too, right? It, I, it's the, I think it's the cake. I mean, it's the icing too, but I think it's the cake because, you know, the fan – and, and, and a person, I'm going to say, I was going to say music creator, but it also applies to people in your job as well. The, our fans, the people right here today, right now, or that are going to watch this broadcast later, that are choosing to give life minutes up, because we only get so many life minutes and we don't know how many they are, but they're choosing to spend time in that moment with you. That relationship is so special and needs to be honored in a way that's different than all the other relationships in our life. And so... You know, when we, I had like, when you're talking about the letter, I had this one woman, you know, how you have those moments, those things that you remember. I was doing a very small show in a park in uh, the city here in Ottawa as part of this City Sounds programming. It was like 40 degrees Celsius for us. So ridiculously hot. Like we were in a, a heat wave. The show really should have been canceled. This woman was, she was in her late seventies. She was a fan of mine. She drove, it was about an hour, an hour and 15 minutes away to this little park. And she set up her, her portable chair and her little umbrella with her hat. And she sat there in that sweltering heat while I went through my set. And I saw her from the stage and went right up to her after. And I was like, what are you doing here? It's like an hour and a half away or so. And you're going to die. And like that stuck with me because, and that is, that, that reminds us that we bear a responsibility that when we are performing or we say we're going to do a show or you're going to host your show and people look forward to that, 
you have entered into a relationship. And so we bear that responsibility to honor their time and give everything that we have. And that's whether I'm coaching or whether I'm on stage or whether I'm in a songwriting room or whatever, because I mean, if you can come back to those moments and, and sit in the gratitude and the awe of it all, it's like standing by the ocean and seeing the vastness of what it is. And you, you know, there's such a beautiful connection between human beings when, when that happens. And I just feel so privileged to have that as part, part of my life. Let's talk about also your music. If um, folks want to find out about your music and how they can hear more, tell us about your style, the genres you like to participate in. Tell us about that. Um, as a songwriter, I write anything for other people, so I'm all over the place. But for me, my style is described as um, inspirational soul with a touch of country. Because I have a Nashville heart, and I have a heart for country music, but I, I don't sound like a straight-up country artist, you know, being from the North. And so, um, but I do love that style of music. So if you're going to listen to my last single, it's called I Know Who I Am. Um, that's an empowering, soulful, um, you know, adult contemporary temporary soft rock type song and my last EP where the light comes in you know has a touch of country but it's more adult contemporary soft rock soul very soulful do you prefer to be the songwriter or the singer or is it 50 50 now Tara it's shared I um sometimes I write a great song that I just know is not a Tara Shannon song and so I just I you know pitch it elsewhere and sometimes other people write a great an outside song and pitch it to me and it is a perfect Tara Shannon song and I could never have told that story myself as well as those writers did so I love all the different angles um and ways to come at music um and I just I just I love to sing and I love to be on stage and I love connecting with an audience so whatever songs make up the best collection you know, for, for an experience, I'm, I'm open to all of it. Who is the book uh, designed for, in addition to the folks that we mentioned, can anybody that reads this book get some value out of it in different ways that they can go about their life continually? I think so. That's the feedback we're getting. I mean, it is particularly to music creators, but anybody in the music business and any uh, like any side of the music business, I've been getting feedback that they love it. And it really should be every independent artist or signed artist or anybody should be reading it, which is great. Anybody that has a creative part of their life, whether it's writing or painting or dancing or something, it would be helpful to them. And then for just like the universal thread, it has some really great tips in there just on how to stay connected to self how to have clarity of vision for your life and how to sit in gratitude and joy. What was the process like the writing process? I imagine very therapeutic and cathartic for you as well. It, it, you know what it, it was at the end of it, I was like, Oh wow. Like I, it's kind of written like the workshops and the, and the, the multi-week classes that I run, like it was, it really just was a culmination of the way that I teach. Um, and it was very, I fell in love with, with that kind of writing because as a songwriter, we have a very limited amount of real estate to work with to get a story told. You have what, three and a half, four minutes. So having more space and, and more breath to, to, to expand on my ideas, I was like, this is great. Cause with songwriting, it's redactive. You know, you're always trying to get every single syllable needs to be doing a job, but this, I had more space. So it was really nice. And I have two more planned. And so I just, yeah, I think writing is just has become a, a regular part of my life, you know? So I do more blog writing and now more books to come. And I, yeah, I, I didn't know that I was this kind of writer, but I've since discovered that. You've since discovered it, always making the discoveries by just checking into that why. Um, do, are you doing a lot online? Like you mentioned the workshops and sessions and things. Tell us about that. Yeah, I do. Um, a bunch of different types of coaching. So it's part of the community called the Grove and grow is in parentheses, so G-R-O. And it's, a, we help you, I help you grow into your potential. And so that's under the banner of Willow Sound Records, which is my label. And so I do life coaching, uh, which is a very specific type of coaching to help artists really get into alignment with themselves. And it's a lot of self inquiry and then um, strategic planning, social media management, like the more practical coaching from a mentorship standpoint and an industry uh, professional standpoint. I do song coaching and performance coaching. So I really treat it as holistic. So if somebody signs up, which they can go to the site and it's gro-ve.com, um, they can look at the type of coaching there. And, you know, when you sign up for one session, 
I really look at you holistically. Like what's going on in your world? What are you trying to do? Like, what are you looking for guidance with? And we put together a program for you that, that makes sense. That's really cool. You were mentioning that now that you've got this book, there's more to come. Yeah, I have. Uh, I've started sort of sketching out the idea of you and social media. It's become the you series. So you and the music business, you and social media to give people a tool to navigate social media in a way that um, makes sense. And again, keeps them you know grounded and in alignment that they can come back to and refer to. Um, I think that that information is super important for people to understand why these platforms were designed um, and how when things are free, it's because you are the product. And so how to how to navigate those spaces and really use them to build your audience, but in a way that that is balanced and sustainable, because the other you know thing with social media is to get any real traction, you have to be putting money into an ad spend so that the, that machine is running in the background to really you know increase your reach. Um, so understanding the mechanics of how these platforms work is really important. So yeah, so that's what I'm, I'm toying with right now. And then maybe the third one might be you and your, and your live show and diving into the psychology of being a performer, um, and the relationship between the performer and the audience. Getting out there on stage and, and doing it all. Um, you know, you're right too, because a lot of people don't realize that, uh, it's paid based a lot of things. So if you post something or you want something to reach more than just the 20 people that are part of your nucleus, you know, the mother, the father, the sister, the brother, the aunt, the uncle, all of that, the best friend, um, it, the paid part of it is how it's become. Didn't necessarily roll out. We're talking about social media. It didn't roll out necessarily that way, which I, it's pretty ingenious what they did. You know, they, they, they got us, all on it mm -hmm. with any, no mention of any of that. Yep. And then ads started rolling in and then in order for you now to reach more, there's expenditure that needs to happen as well. If that's what you hope to do. If you're just saying, Hey, good morning. Here's the baby picture. I, I had a tuna melt for lunch different, but if it's where it, there's branding and other things involved, yeah. <laughs> exactly. It's my Irish humor coming out. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, and there's a lot of that on there too. But if you, you know, looking to grow and, and connect and have it go further, it's uh, pay to play. Oh, yeah. It's pay yeah. to play. Yeah. I mean, on average, I mean, I mean, this is a whole other show in and of itself. We'll talk. have to have you back and talk about all that, right? Yeah. Part two. Doing, Especially yeah. when you write the book, You and Ice Cream. <laughs> <laughs> But then I would have to tell everybody how much ice cream I eat. And, I'm not and sure. we've got it. We'd have to have, yeah, we'd have to have the ice cream in front of us. I'll Absolutely. have to come up, come up to Ontario and we'll sample at a local ice cream shop. Yes, <laughs> I would love that. I would love that. If your viewers want to get more information in depth, I really recommend it's part of my, my curriculum um, reading or watching is the social dilemma. It's a documentary on Netflix yes. and it, it will, if anybody's watching this and wants to get an insight into how those platforms work. Oh, it actually thing. works. It's, yeah. it's not just, there it is. There's a lot of marketing business, a <laughs> lot behind it as well. <laughs> yeah. This, uh, it's really an invaluable book because again, a lot of people are struggling with a lot of different things just in general these days, but especially if you're in, you know, you hear, you hear conversations with, and we've had some of them on our show legendary artists, people who've been doing this for, and big name people who've come through and they'll talk about how they just want to do what they do and all the other stuff and, and the way it's changed is so difficult for them to want to even bother with or deal with, comprehend or pay attention to because they, you know, um, oftentimes, they just want to do it now after at this point because they love it yeah. and they still want to share it with the world. It's something that's inbred in them. And there is that balance, that jiggle and jangle that they're trying to navigate. And, uh, and, and then, you know, sometimes even the larger somebody is a lot of times you think you know, on social media, you are talking directly to them and you're really not, you are talking to somebody who's sort of overseeing uh, the management of the yeah. image and the branding and the social media, just because they, there's not enough hours in the day to always, you know, be able to be incredibly responsive. But that's another thing too, because people want you to be people, 
get hurt if you don't, or you yeah. can't. Oh, they didn't respond to me right away. They didn't respond to my text, my email, my post, or the private message or whatever, that if you don't respond right away, people are like, what's wrong with you? Or what's the problem or why? And it's just, you know, you just came back from an uncle's funeral or something, you know, give, give, can I have a few, maybe give me an hour, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> let the limos right. leave first, you know, <laughs> and, 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 but this like no toleration for that. It's like, I know. and for artists, and it's not personal. No, it's not. And artists that have been, because when I was first starting in music, there was no internet, you know? So we, have, I mean, I'm not on the level of like legendary, but imagine those huge artists that, you know, had to adjust to this new space where there was a boundary before. Like we just, you decided when a fan had access to you, meet and greets, you know, parties, corporate events or whatever. And now the expectation is that your fans have access to you 24 seven all the time. So, it, and it becomes something to, to manage, you know, and, and setting proper boundaries. I always, I love the way Adele handles it because she's, she's just like, I make a record. I come out, I'm here for you guys all day long. And then I disappear. I disappear for a bit. I live my life. I find out things to write songs about. And then I come up with another record. Like that cycle yeah. is the cycle you were talking right. about. Before, right That's there's people how, in these yeah. industries right exactly there's people actors actresses there's people in the television industry too like johnny carson on the tonight show he did the show made some public appearances but he was home in malibu playing tennis he was doing his thing with the family he wasn't necessarily always at every gala and every party and always hobnobbing and always out there and um david letterman another one yeah who would do the show and then get in the car and go back to his home in the suburbs of Connecticut. Um, and you wouldn't necessarily see him engaged all the time. You know, he would be when there were things that involving the network or the show or other people that he revered that he wanted to be connected to, but he did what he did that he loved doing and provided the entertainment, but he reserved a place for himself. And I think you do need, if you're somebody who does like to have your family time or your quiet time or your alone time, there is that part too, where that needs to be respected and honored and revered because that's the time where you reboot, where you re-energize, where you feel connected where you get to feel like there's a reason why I'm doing all of those things, why I'm killing myself 24 seven, seven days a week and flying on planes and running here and doing there and touring or whatever it may be is to please the masses, but also please yourself and that nucleus of loved ones and friends who've been with you through thick and thin. Yeah. And so it's a two way street. It needs to be the artist or the performer or whoever, People just in society in general should yeah. be respect of one another, no matter what the scenario is. But then on the flip side, those who are the consumers of it and those who value it and appreciate it should give some slack to those who are working hard to provide for you the joy and those moments of taking you away from your day-to-day -day humdrum and the stress of the craziness of life, right? It's a, it it's a, should be a two-way relationship. Yeah with respect, absolutely. And we can't give if we're empty. So, and, and knowing whether you're an introvert or an extro extrovert and the things that fill you up is really important too. Like I, I have, have an extroverted personality. I'm very, like, I love people and I love that, but I'm an introvert from an energetic standpoint. Like I need to disconnect, read a book, curl up on myself to refuel, to, to fill up, you know? So we can't give when we're empty. So we really have to take care of ourselves and we have to give each other the space they need and the respect to do that. Um, which is that's yeah. an extroverted in, extroverted introvert is what they said that is yeah yeah exactly you're extroverted when you're on and you're excited and you're passionate and you've got things that you're doing and then you need and require the time maybe the day after to come down from that high and and reboot and plug in and just you know stay in the jammies have hot cocoa and watch movies yeah, absolutely <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And so <laughs> Sounds pretty good, huh? <laughs> yeah, it does. It does. Uh, here is the book, everybody. We're speaking to a uh, renowned singer, songwriter, and uh, coach, yes, as well as author, published author, mom to seven. <laughs> <laughs> Tara Shannon is here from Ontario, Canada. There is the book, You 
and the music business, really an invaluable self-help guide and tool, whether you're in the business or not, or you know somebody who's been in it a long time or somebody that you know is, you know, can use a little boost and guidance. And then she also does workshops and sessions and things of that nature as well, which is cool. This was awesome, my friend. And here I want to let folks know that there's this website too. And the book, is it on Amazon and all the places yeah, to go? Yeah, you can go to Amazon. Yeah, you can find it there. You can find it on my website if you go to booktara.co. Um, it's also through Ingram Sparks too, globally. So you can get on chapters or online and stuff like that. Or Indigo, I think it's called. Yeah, yeah exactly right. Yeah. And for everybody watching around the world, if this is your first time here or you just love this conversation, you love what we're doing here at our Entertainment Lifestyle Celebrity Talk Show series, just right perfectly in line with what we were saying moments ago during this conversation about the music industry and just the craziness of life and the importance of staying connected. Even we here at the Gym Master Show Live, hope you give this episode a like, <laughs> yeah. share the episode, leave a comment, interact with us, leave a comment on the episode. Even if you commented in the Lovety Hall chat room live, leave a comment under the episode and subscribe to our YouTube channel, Gym Masters TV, where there's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of episodes archived for your pleasure. And we really appreciate that. And that does help us grow and stay connected and reach a larger global audience, which uh, just, you know, more commentary and more interaction and more fabulous people discovering it. So uh, it does take a village, right, Tara? It does. It definitely does. This was a pleasure, a pleasure to meet you as well. And we've been showing, sprinkling in, you know, some of the comments. Thank you, Dave. Welcome to the Gym Master Show Live series and <laughs> Kathleen in New York City and Maureen in Arizona, USA and Pierre Kelly here. Afternoon, you all. Thank you very much. We love it. And Dave is watching, listening in, uh, viewing in Ontario, Canada. Thank you very much, Dave. We appreciate that as well. And everybody commenting from the, the world here. Uh, we showed this earlier. Miss Pat in Texas. Howdy, everyone. Good to see you as well. Thank you very much, Miss Pat. And uh, Merlin is here from Canada. She's she's actually right there in Ontario. And uh, what did she write? She wrote, "Welcome, Tara, from a fellow Ontarian." Yay. Very very nice. And uh, Gary is watching as well. Good afternoon, Lovities. That's love and levity together that we put together here. And Lisa says hello and, and everybody commenting live and who will comment hopefully later on our channel. Tara, spread the word about the Gym Master Show live series. We're doing something a little unique, sort of bringing back the lore starter conversation uh, with, you know, great conversation, humor, entertainment, live interaction, and um, some inspiration sprinkled in as well. Congratulations on this epic 30 plus year career, mom to seven, songwriter, singer, author, coach, uh, a real balancing act, but you seem to be mastering it and loving the ride along the way and touching the lives of others in a beautiful way as well. And I hope you enjoyed the time with me as much as I have with you here on the show. I did. Thank you so much for having me in Lovety Hall. It was fantastic and uh, just love chatting with you and good luck with everything. And uh, thanks everybody for watching. Absolutely. We'll keep the porch light on for you. As I always say, you're welcome back to the Gym Masters show anytime, my friend. And let's definitely stay in touch. And if you know other folks you think, maybe even some of the folks you deal with that you think would like to pop on for a quick conversation and chat, they're all welcome to join us as well. I'd love that. Thank you so much. Absolutely. You be well. And a couple of more comments in here. Kim, Thanks. great interview. Hi, Tara. And fantastic show, Miss Patton, Texas. Thank you, gang. I love that. Everybody loving it. Merlin is seconding what uh, Dave says, listening in Ontario. Tara, congratulations on everything. One more time for everybody. Here is the book. It's really a work of art and a labor of love for Tara and so many people. The reviews have been really, it's well received, isn't it, Tara? Yeah. Yeah. Thank goodness. I was very nervous about that, but uh, the community has been wonderful. You throw it up there and see where it lands and it's landed in the sweet spot, which is fantastic. Thanks for all the time. We really appreciate it. New friend made. High five. High five. From Canada. All right. Thanks everybody. You be well and keep the cold weather up there if you can. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Will do. We're having a heat wave. It's 33. Oh, wow. <laughs> That's it. 
<laughs> take care, Tara. Take care. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye. Cheers. Cheers. Tara Shannon joining us here live on the Gym Master Show, live entertainment, lifestyle, celebrity talk show series. There is the book. It's really a page turner, invaluable self-help guide, surviving the music industry, dealing with it, and of course, taking time for yourself, which we always talk about here. Take time for yourself, love one another, take care of one another, and don't forget to um, you know love yourself. So important. We you know what's great and cool about this series? None of it is scripted. We don't pre-script questions. I'm not reading a teleprompter. You know, in my professional work in TV and radio, there are times where there's a teleprompter or there's a pre-written script we've written or whatever. Uh, but I love ad lib. I love free flowing conversations and you guys involved. I think it just makes a difference. We go a little deeper, you know, and um, we talk about the book, we talk about the music, we talk about her songs, her songwriting, and also why she does what she does. And now you've got a real sense of who she is as a person, which I think is really cool. And then I sprinkle in some of my experiences life experiences, career experiences, things I'm passionate about as well. And I think it makes a world of difference uh, when we're all together and you guys commenting. Don't forget, like, comment, subscribe. And of course, we thank you for that. And we thank Tara for joining us here. She was fantastic. I do want to let you know as well, tomorrow, don't miss it, 7 p.m. Eastern, 4 p.m. Pacific. Look who's with us. Yes, but Adido King son of music icon, talking about this music theme today, Ben E. King. Ben E. King is the person you know that mastered the incredible and created the song Stand By Me and also Save the Last Dance for Me and so many iconic hits. Ben E. King, his son, phenomenal singer and songwriter, joining us tomorrow is the son of a legend, Benny King joining us tomorrow on the show, which is incredible. Can't wait. And then coming up on Wednesday, actress Dana Kippel is joining us too. And she's got some exciting things to share with us. She's very excited to be here. Can't wait to welcome her to the show as well. And again, we thank Tara for joining us here on the Gym Master Show Live series. It was cool. Again, another shot for you. There's the book right there. I think you'll enjoy it. Uh, check it out on Amazon and everywhere else. Hope you guys are having a good day. As I said at the top, very busy day for me. Uh, about five radio shows I hosted, a TV shoot, and then we've got a busy week of these shows. And then we've got a big TV shoot on um, Saturday and just it's crazy, busy, busy. But I love it. And I always love spending time with you and you and you and you. And if you like what we're doing, if you like the vibe and you like the show, let us know. Like, comment, subscribe. And we sincerely appreciate that. And we value and welcome you. And we thank you. If this was your first time here joining us, thanks for joining us. Come see us again, like uh, Dave in Ontario, Canada. Come see us again, Dave, and everybody watching and, and Kim watching as well. Thank you very much. Great to have you. You're now part of the Gym Master Show Lovety family. Come by and see us. Uh, archived shows galore, hundreds of great guests major music stars, major people from Hollywood, television, Broadway, comedy, inspiration, culinary arts, sports, you name it, have stopped by the Gym Master Show Live. Celebrity friends of mine from my professional work in TV and radio have all stopped by the show and we've had great conversations with them. Thank you, Kathleen. Thank you, Merlin. Thank you, Ms. Pat in Texas. Thank you, everybody for watching and spread the word, share this episode on your social media. And again, give us a like, thumbs up, like, leave a comment for us, subscribe to the channel and enjoy more from our series. Love doing this for all of you. I'm your host, Jim Masters. One more time. Thank you, Tara, for being with us. What a great conversation. Went in a lot of different directions. I thought it was really, really cool. And we thank you, of course, for being with us here on the show. It always means the world when you're here and uh, you're celebrating what we do. We, we thank you for all of that. Again, don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, share, all the rest. Thanks for being with us. Thanks for spending time with us here at Lovely Hall. And as I always say, don't forget to love one another, take care of one another, and don't forget to take time for yourself. Take time to breathe and enjoy life because it goes by fast and it's really precious and special. So thanks for being with us. We love you all. Thanks for listening to this episode and watching The Gym Master Show live coming to you from Lovety Hall, JMS. Be well. See you on the next one. 
Ben E. King's son will be with us tomorrow, 7 Eastern, 4 Pacific. Join us if you can. Cheers. <laughs>